radiology of head and neck so in this class we will study the skull x-ray andro posterior view lateral view open mouth view then paracnesial sinus x-ray that is waters view and caldwell's view then xylography and angiogram so this is the skull x-ray andro posterior view here you can clearly see the coronal suture then you can see the sagittal suture then here you can see the margins of orbit the nasal septum and the nasal cavity then here you can see the mandible mandibular condyle and the ramus of the mandible then here you can see the frontal air sinus a bit of ethmoid air sinus then here you can see below the orbit the maxillary air sinus now the next is the skull lateral view here you should observe for the paranasal sinuses all the paranasal sinuses are visible in the skull lateral view here you can see the also you can see the cella turcica and the bony features of orbit and the mandible and nose and the oral cavity should be observed and also cervical vertebra so let us see the x-ray in detail this is again the skull x-ray lateral view here you can see the paranasal sinus that is the frontal sinus then here you can see the ethmoid sinus then maxillary sinus and the sphenoidal air sinus then here you can see the hypophyseal fossa then this is the anterior clinoid process and this is the posterior clinoid process and in hypophyseal fossa you get the pituitary and the inferior relation of hypophyseal fossa is sphenoidal air sinus and what is the pathology we can get sometimes you can get a cranio pharyngeal canal then you can see the hard palate that is formed by the palatine process of maxilla and the horizontal plate of palatine bone then the condyle of the mandible and the coronoid process of mandible then you can see the ramus of the mandible then also you can see the roof of the orbit and the floor of the orbit here also you can see the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone and the crista galli where you get the attachment of false cerebrae then here you can see the anterior tubercle of c1 vertebrae and the axis so this is a view of the hypophyseal fossa that is in the bone here you can uh, see the optic uh, canal and the sulcus chiasmaticus where you get the optic chiasma then here you can see the uh, end of the lesser wing you get the anterior clinoid process then you have the dorsum cellae with the posterior clinoid process and here you get the tuberculum cellae the tuberculum cellae and the hypophyseal fossa and the dorsum cellae together form the cella turcica and where you get the pituitary gland so this is again another x-ray that is x-ray of the skull lateral view showing again here you can see the maxillary sinus then frontal sinus then here you can see the orbit and uh, here you can also see the internal occipital protuberance and the cella turcica and the sphenoid sinus then here you can see the clearly the groove for the middle meningeal vessels so middle meningeal vessels it is a branch middle meningeal artery is a branch of the maxillary artery the first part of maxillary artery and the branches are frontal and parietal
and here, here also you can see the mastoid air cells mastoid air cells and here also here you can see the hyoid bone then the mental protuberance and the mandible and the ramus of the mandible So mastoid air cells, they vary considerably in uh, number, form and size. It is interconnected and uh, lined by squamous non-ciliated epithelium. And the mastoid process, it can be, the air cells can be of three types, that is pneumatic, sclero, sclerotic or mixed. So you get three types of mastoid air cells, pneumatic, sclerosed or sclerotic or mixed. And the mastoid process developed by the age of two years. And andrum is well developed at birth. And it is, there is an aditus in the middle layer and it leads to the mastoid andrum. So here again you can see the, that is S-ray skull, lateral view. You can see the groove for the medium meningeal artery clearly. Then here you can see the coronal suture. Then uh, that is the maxillary sinus. Then here you have the ethmoidal air sinus and frontal sinus here. Then here you have the lambdoid suture, then mastoid air cells, and here is the external occipital protuberance. Then here you get the anterior arch of atlas and the dense of axis vertebra and here again coronoid process of the mandible and here you get the condyle of the mandible this is the ramus of the mandible mm -hmm. so here again you get the palate now what is the function of this uh, paranasal sinus It is mainly to warm and humidify the inspired air and to make the skull lighter and to add resonance to the voice. So that is again a close-up close, close -up view of the lateral view of the skull x-ray. So here you can see the cella tersica, groove for the medium meningeal vessel, cribriform plate clearly and the crista galli, then anterior clinal process, posterior clinal process. And here you can see the clivus also. And below, just below the cella tersica, you get the sphenoidal air sinus. Now, cella, cella tersica, there are certain pathologies uh, which you should observe in uh, while viewing the X-ray. One is erosion due to the increased intracranial pressure. Then ballooning, it can be due to the pituitary tumor. Then non-specific enlargement can occur for the cella tersica. Then sometimes cellular tersica will be flattened due to the supracellular space occupying lesions. Now this is another view that is odontoid view or the open mouth view. This is mainly done to study the dense, the atlas and the axis vertebra. So here you can see the dense, then two is the anterior arch of the atlas and this is the transverse process of atlas. Now the nose and paranasal sinuses can be studied by two views that is Waters view and Caldwell's view. So this Waters view is otherwise called as occipital mental view. So in 1914 Dr. C.A. Waters and Waldron, two British radiologists introduced this view. Here the nose and the chin touch the film and the X-ray beam is projected from the occipital side. And open mouth view shows the sphenoid sinus and petrous bones are projected below the maxillary sinus and fracture of uh, the nasal bones and the displacement can also be studied in this x-ray. So here you can see the nose and chin is against the x-ray film. So this is the water's view that is the occipital mental view. Here you can clearly see the frontal sinus then this is the ethmoidal air sinus and here you get the 
maxillary air sinus. So this is the bony orbit and this is the nasal septum and the nasal cavity. So this is another water's view. So here you can see again the frontal sinus and here you get the ethmoidal air sinus. Then uh, you get the nasal bone and the nasal septum here. Then maxillary sinus. Then here you can see the sphenoidal air sinus. So in this picture you can see this is the frontal sinus. Then this is the ethmoidal air sinus. Then we have the zygomatic or frontal suture here. Then the maxillary air sinus on either side then zygoma and the zygomatic arch then you can see the orbit and this is the inferior orbital margin and the superior orbital margin So in cases of maxillary sinusitis, that is inflammation of the maxillary sinus, you will be able to see the opacity in the maxillary sinus. Also, you will be able to see a fluid, air fluid level in the area of the maxillary sinus in case of sinusitis. So here you can see that the left side is normal, whereas in the right side there is a sinusitis. Here you can see the air fluid level. So this is again another view that is a water's view that is here you can see the frontal sinus then orbit here also you can see the sphenoid greater wing of sphenoid as well as the lesser wing of sphenoid then here you can see the nasal septum then you can see the ethmoidal air sinus just below the frontal air sinus you can see the ethmoidal air sinus then below the orbit you have the maxillary air sinus then uh, the sphenoid air sinus is not very clear then you can see the dental arch then you can see the condylar process of the mandible as well as the coronoid process so development of paranasal sinus is important especially the maxillary sinus is usually present at birth and the ethmoid sinus will be rudimentary and sphenoidal air sinus and frontal air sinus will not be present at birth. So the first radiological evidence of maxillary sinus is seen 4 to 5 months after birth. Then ethmoid sinus radiological evidence comes by 1 year and sphenoid air sinus become evident by 4 years and frontal air sinus by 6 years. And there is another view that is Caldwell's view or the occipitofrontal view. Eugene Caldwell described a view of the paranasal sinus that bear his name. That is Caldwell's view. Here the nose and the forehead. So in Waters view it, it was the nose and the chin. So here it is the nose and the forehead that is touching the film and the x-ray beam is projected 15 to 20 degree quarterly. Frontal and ethmoid sinus can be seen well in this view. So that is the Caldwell's view. So here you can see, uh, visualize the upper part of the frontal and uh, the ethmoid sinus also. So here you can see the frontal sinus, then cribriform plate of ethmoid, then superior orbital fissure, then orbit, lateral margin of the orbit, upper margin of the orbit. Then you can see the petrous ridge and the mastoid process. Then maxillary air sinus. Then here you can see the lambdoid suture. Then you can see the sphenoid bone. The lesser wing of the sphenoid you can see. And the greater wing. Then this is the ethmoidal air sinus. 
then here you can see the nasal septum then alveolar process of the maxilla then transverse process of c1 so these are the structures which can be seen in the caldwell's view so the structures seen in caldwell's view are frontal ethmoid and maxillary sinus frontal process of zygoma zygomatic process of frontal bone superior margin of orbit and uh, lamina papyracea that is uh, forming the wall of the ethmoid sinus then superior orbital fissure so caldwell's view of the sinus here you can see the nasal septum then frontal air sinus then you can see the ethmoidal air sinus here then maxillary air sinus then five is the inferior turbinate then odontoid process now the lateral view of the skull against the film the lateral view of the skull can be used to study the paranasal sinus so here the extra beam is projected perpendicular from the other side the structures seen are anterior and posterior extent of sphenoid frontal and maxillary sinuses cella tersica ethmoid sinus then alveolar process condyle and neck of mantle so the paranasal sinus x ray this is the frontal air sinus this is the lateral view so here you get the frontal air sinus then you can see the ethmoidal air sinus then maxillary air sinus and the sphenoid air sinus just below the cella tersica now this is the x ray of the neck lateral view here you can clearly see the dens then anterior tubercle of c1 then this is the posterior arch of atlas then here you can see the cervical body of the cervical vertebra and the spinous process and you can see that the c7 transverse spinous process is directed downwards then 4 is the superior articular surface and 5 is the inferior articular surface then this is again another x ray of the neck lateral view showing the cervical spine as well as the cella tersica here you can see the cella tersica also and the maxillary sinus but here you can see the cervical vertebra clearly that is the body of the vertebra then lateral mass of c1 the posterior tubercle of c1 then odontoid process or the dens can be seen here then you can see the c2 then c3 c4 and c5 then c6 and c7 and this is the spinous process of c7 and in between you get the intervertebral disc so in this x-ray he can uh, here you can see the spinous process of c7 is fractured now the fracture of the spinous process of lower cervical vertebra and the upper thoracic vertebra it is called as clay shovel fracture and the fracture of vertebra is uh, very common in coconut tree climbers miners and construction workers and sometimes it can cause injury to the spinal cord or the cord icana so first aid to a patient with injury to the vertebra vertebral column is very important and to avoid the flexion of vertebral column the patient must be shifted to the hospital in face down position the next ray of the cervical spine andro posterior view here you can see the masseter process base of occiput c2 spinous process c2 odontoid process or the dens so here you can uh, get the joint atlanto axial joint and the atlanto occipital joint then we have the c3 then c4 c5 then c6 and the c7 transverse process then we have the t1 
here you can see a shadow that is a tracheal air shadow and here you can see the apex of lung so another joint is the intervertebral joint that also you can get here now here you can see that uh, the c7 transverse process has uh, given rise to an extra rib that is called a cervical rib so here you can see the cervical rib on the right side so this side it is absent then here you can see the cervical rib on the left side so the frequency is nearly uh, frequency of occurrence is nearly 1 in 200 and uh, it can uh, the cervical rib can result in thoracic outlet syndrome now the fracture of the face is uh, classified as leafoot 1 2 and 3 leafoot 1 involves uh, just the palate and leaf foot 2 involving the nasal bone as well as the palate then leaf foot 3 involves the orbit as well as uh, the almost the entire face then there are uh, certain uh, radiological examinations which uh, you should uh, know that is one is sialography that is radiological examination of the salivary gland submandibular parotid and uh, sublingual gland is studied uh, with the so that is a sialography of the parotid gland here you can see the arrow is on the parotid duct then the view of the submandibular gland with the help of a dye that is again sialogram here you can see the duct and uh, main indication is in case of any if you suspect any calculi mm -hmm. then another is orthopandemography that is the tomography of the mandible is studied in this so it is mainly for uh, uh, to study the dentition maxillary and mandibular dentition and alveolar arches and uh, the contiguous structures are studied on a single film then another important thing is uh, important imaging way of imaging the thyroid gland that is called as thyroid imaging here the dye used is a technetium 99 per technate to determine the thyroid function so there are the nodules are classified as hot nodule and cold nodule and on to four percent of the hot nodules are malignant and up to 25 percent of the cold nodule is malignant so over functioning nodules are called as hot nodules and non-functioning nodules are the cold nodules so here you have the you can see the hot nodule that is more radiolucent compared to the thyroid and cold nodule is uh, radio opaque compared to the thyroid gland Then we have the angiography that is here you can see the brachiocephalic trunk then we have the right subclavian artery then the right vertebral artery here you can see the right vertebral artery then fourth is the right common carotid artery then dividing into the right external carotid and right internal carotid artery then here you can see the left internal carotid artery and this is the left subclavian artery and the left common carotid artery that is coming from the iota so what are the branches of subclavian artery from the first part you get vertebral internal thoracic and thyrocervical trunk as well as the costo cervical trunk from on the left side and from the second part you get the costo cervical trunk on the right side and from the third part you get dorsal scapular artery so this is again subclavian angiogram here you can see the iota and that is a subclavian artery with the vertebral artery and this is not uh, very clear here you can see the thyrocervical trunk and the dorsal scapular artery 
So this is the vertebral artery and the thyrosophical trunk and the internothoracic and the scapular artery. Now the study of MRI, the axial head sections run from the inferior orbital margin to external acoustic meatus. So that is the axial section of the neck. Here you can see the maxillary sinus, then ethmoidal air cells, the nasal septum, this is the trigeminal nerve, then internal carotid artery, basilar artery, pons and medulla. Then you can see the head of the mandible and the temporalis muscle and masseter. Then mid sagittal section of the neck where you get the pharyngeal tonsils. Then you can see the hard palate, soft palate, then anterior arch fatless and the dense. And here you can see the muscles, genioglossus, geniohyoid and mylohyoid. Then cricoid cartilage and arytenoid cartilage. Then here you can see the thyroid cartilage. Then this is the mandible, 12 is the mandible, then hyoid bone. Then here you can see the epiglottis and the vallecula. Then vocal cord, false vocal cord. Then uh, sternothyroid. Then this is the thyroid gland. And also in uh, MRI, you can see the spinal cord and the vertebra and the, you can see the vertebra and the intervertebral disc and the spinal cord passing through the canal. So this is a lateral view showing the left orbit with the distortion of greater and lesser wing of left sphenoid bone. That is here you can see the left orbit is enlarged. So this is usually common in neurofibromatosis. Then this is a venogram where you can see the study the dural venous sinus. It is not done nowadays. Superior sagittal sinus, right sinus, transverse sinus and sigmoid sinus and confluence of sinus can be seen here.